We know the trials that God allowed Job to endure. The devil requested to test him. And God permitted it. And Job did not curse God, but he and his friends tried to answer, tried to reason through all of this. Why was this happening? How could this be happening? And God ultimately gave Job a speech that caused him to say the things we heard in today's first reading. He said, okay, Lord, I'm not going to say anything anymore because you obviously are so far beyond my understanding. It's like what we read in the prophet Isaiah. My thoughts are not your thoughts as far as the heavens are above the earth are my thoughts and my ways above yours. The humility, the understanding of the difference between being a creature, as we all are, and being God. Sure, we can complain to God, question things. God understands that we do that. Our human mind wants to know why things are the way they are. But God also wants us to understand what he told Job. He says, it's beyond you. So many things are beyond us, and part of our worship of God is to bow before him with this humble spirit that Job expressed, or, to put it another way, place ourselves in the Father's hand with, hands with this childlike confidence like Jesus expressed in today's gospel, knowing and being content with knowing that it's way beyond us why God does the things he does, permits the things he permits, way beyond us. But brothers and sisters, the fact that it's way beyond us does not cause us to lose trust, peace, and joy. Trust and peace and joy that we express in the psalm here, saying, I know, Lord, that your ordinances are just. Listen to what the psalmist says. You are just. Anything God does is right because he's God. And the psalmist says, In your faithfulness you have afflicted me. He says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted. God knows what he's doing, in other words. He knows what he's doing. And that's why Jesus said to the apostles, you know, you're rejoicing because you have certain gifts that you're exercising among the community. You're casting out demons. The demons are subject to you. Okay, that's great. I've given you that power. The Lord gave certain power to his apostles. He gives gifts to us. He gives the gift of the priesthood to me and to, to every other priest. We rejoice in that. He gives gifts to, to you. Maybe you're a parent. He gives gifts to you to carry out your profession. He gives gifts of service to you to to give to your community. Many of you are active in the pro-life movement, which is why you're connected with us. He gives us gifts. But he says, the thing you should rejoice in the most are not these gifts that I give you, because what matters the most is that you're accepting the kingdom like a little child and that your names are written in heaven. And that goes back to Job. Job lost Children and properties and animals. And in the end, he he was more blessed than he was before. But when he lost all those things, remember what he said? The Lord gives and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It wasn't an explanation for why he gave or why he took away. It was an acknowledgement that his thoughts are above our thoughts, his ways beyond ours. Lord, I will put my hand over my mouth. I will not speak because you asked me, where were you when I established the heavens, set the pillars of the earth in place? Where were you when I command the sunrise? How do you know how it happens? And Job says, these are things beyond me. You are God. But again, the thing we know for sure Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Not trials or distresses or persecution or danger. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. It is only our own sins that reject that love, but even then he doesn't stop loving us. He loved us while we were still sinners, died for us while we were still in rebellion and enmity with him. That doesn't change. 
His love, you can't turn his love off. You can go reject it, but you can't turn it off. So, Lord, I put myself in your hands like a little child. I accept the kingdom. And that's what I rejoice in. You know, the saints had a, the monks of old always had a saying, what is this in the light of eternity? And some of the monks, they would keep a skull on their desk. A skull. A real human skull on their desk. So they saw it each day as they did their work. Saw it each morning when they got up, each night when they went to bed, to remind them, what is this in the light of eternity? Anything that I suffer, any distress or trial that I have, let me think of this in the light of eternity that reminds me that it's passing, it will end, that it's light in comparison with the joy of heaven and the pains of hell. Any joy or pain on this earth is light. And therefore, it also applies to the gifts I have. Uh, maybe the de demons are subject to me. The, 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 the possessions I have, the relationships I have, all these things are good. We thank God for them all. But what is this in the light of eternity? What are our joys, our accomplishments? If we have joy in a relationship, that is only a dim reflection of the intensity of joy in relationships we will have in heaven. Such a dim reflection. What is this in the light of eternity? We rejoice in the things of this earth in order to deepen our expectation and longing for the infinitely greater joy in these, those things that we will have in the world to come. So relationships, possessions, oh, what we will possess in heaven. The beautiful things we see, a dim reflection of the beauty we will see in the new heavens and the new earth. The joy we have in prayer and in possessing God and the sacraments now, we will see Him face to face. What is this in the light of eternity? Rejoice not so much that the demons are subject to you. Rejoice that your names are inscribed in heaven. Job, do not despair because if you've lost everything. Rejoice because your name is written in heaven. No one can take away from you your fidelity to God your fidelity to Christ. Father Benedict Rochelle knew that. Now, many of you knew him, followed him, listened to him. He was one of my key mentors, one of my seminary professors. In fact, I met him before I went into the seminary. I was just a high school student when I first met him because he lived about 15 minutes away from where I lived. Uh, uh, my parents still live in uh, Port Chester, New York, and, and we uh, grew up there, and, and Father Benedict was over there in uh, New Rochelle, Westchester County, and I went to listen to him as a, as a, as a teenager. I, was, I went to public schools, and uh, uh, one of my other classmates in, in, in our public school was uh, uh, actually the one who brought me to listen to Father Benedict. And then, you know, I went into college seminary with the Salesians, and Father Benedict came and taught there. And then in New York, Archdiocese of New York, of course, he ran the Office of Spiritual Development, so he was one of our spiritual directors, one of our professors. I went with him to the Holy Land. And in fact, at the ordination of each priest, the priest chooses another priest, a friend or mentor, to put this, the chasuble, to place it over their head for the very first time in that ordination ceremony as they are about to say Mass for the very first time. And so Father Benedict was the one that put the chasuble on me during my ordination ceremony back in 1988. Because, and then after that, you know, I kept in, in constant contact with him and he guided me in various, uh, in various ways in developing this ministry of Priests for Life. And, uh, well, he leaves us a lot to think about in terms of our lesson from these readings and also in terms of our dealing with the problems in our church and in our nation and in our world. We remember him with gratitude today. He died six years ago on this very day, October 3rd. And uh, his teachings continue on. Be sure to get his uh, books, look up his, his books, his tapes, lots of audio recordings uh, from him that really help us all in the spiritual life. And brothers and sisters, as we did at the beginning of the Mass, we also continue to pray uh, for our president. And, uh, you know, he is a, a man 
who he believes in the power of prayer, believes in the Word of God. God bless him for holding up the, the Word of God in the midst of these, these vicious attacks on our church and on our country by these uh, angry left mobs and left-wing mobs. He stood in front of a church that had been burned the night before and held up the Word of God. Do you see what is going on here? This is an expression of solidarity. We hold up the Word of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Is that familiar to you? The Gospel of the Lord, right? Or, or when we have the Gospel procession, what do we do? We do this. And we consider this, you know, something good. Why? What are we doing? What are we doing when we do this? We're holding up the Gospel book in the middle of the liturgy because the people who are assembled, who are looking at the Pope, looking at the bishop, right, the local bishop, your bishop, looking at the priest, doing what? Holding up the Word of God. Why? Because the people gathered there believe in it. The people gathered there find in it their strength, wisdom, instruction for life, encouragement, source of unity, and cause of determination to know that evil will not triumph. So in the middle of the liturgy, holding up the Word is nourishing that conviction, and then we're called to take that conviction out into the public arena, into the world of politics, into the world of government, into the culture, into the streets. And brothers and sisters, when we hold up the Word of God in the midst of senseless violence, in the midst of those who hate our faith coming against us and attacking it, that is a rallying cry for those who believe in that word and who will say this evil around us will not prevail because God's word says as we heard it today that his face will shine upon us that all things serve him that we are his servants that his word gives us understanding in the midst of confusion, in the midst of trials like Job had. We hold up the word and we need our leaders to hold up the word. And so those who think it's just a prop or a photo op, how absolutely shallow their hearts are, how absolutely devoid of understanding their minds are, how absolutely insincere they are, those that criticize our leaders for, for, for holding the Word of God. What would you prefer? That they throw the Word of God in the garbage like so many judges do on our courts? What would you prefer? That they burn the Word of God like the God-haters on the left do? What would you prefer our leaders do? Let's pray for our president today. He's a man who believes in the Word of God. He's a disciple of Jesus Christ. And he said, in answer to a question asked of him shortly after he took office, Mr. President, what do you want to be most remembered for? He said, I want to be remembered as the president who prayed more than any other. Let's let him also be remembered as the one for whom we prayed more than any other. Praised be Jesus Christ, now and forever.